Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. This morning, I want to conclude our reading of Richard Bennett's uh, very informative newsletter uh, entitled, Roman Catholic Endeavors to Overturn the Reformation. And uh, we'll conclude with that, and we have one more uh, very special uh, newsletter to read from Richard Bennett. Before I begin, I'd like to advise my listeners and encourage you to uh, go to Richard Bennett's website, www.reanbeacon.com. That's B-E-R-E-A-N-B-E-A-C-O-N, reanbeacon.org. And peruse his website, and also, and especially, to subscribe to his email, his email newsletter. And you'll find, as I have, that it's true biblical Christianity. Uh, you know, you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update. I don't hand out many endorsements. I've been surprised and disappointed too many times. But never have I been surprised or disappointed with Richard Bennett. And um, the body of Christ is going to suffer greatly with the loss of Richard Bennett and uh, others like him. And there aren't many. Richard Bennett is unique. Very special to me. And I hope very special to my listeners. And uh, please avail yourselves of the teaching of Richard Bennett. <clears throat> now, hard not to get emotional about that guy. You know, he uh born and raised Roman Catholic. And if you've ever heard his testimony, you know how God himself delivered Richard Bennett from the Roman Catholic Church. And you'll find that information on his website. I encourage you. You'll see the hand of God in that man's life. How merciful God was to Richard Bennett. And uh, Richard Bennett has lived up to God's mercy. And I thank him very, very much. Now, the conclusion of his newsletter, Roman Catholic Endeavors to Overturn the Reformation. If I can gather up my composure again... <clears throat> Richard Bennett writes, It is by the power of grace of the Lord Jesus Christ alone that we can truly live the Christian life as did the Reformers in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. The Lord's sacrifice is for the believer in that he substituted himself in the place of sinners who would come to believe and thus satisfied the law on their behalf. That's why our salvation is free. It's a gift. God bore our guilt on his own body. It was an act of mercy and love. And no one can earn their salvation, or Christ died in vain. He says, so authentic was this substitution that his sacrifice for them eliminated all necessity of punishment. We shall not suffer punishment for our sins. If our sins are washed away in the precious blood of the Lamb, then we have nothing to pay. It's free. It's as if you never sinned. That is the total salvation and redemption of man through Christ's blood and his sacrifice alone. He said, in, be, in, in becoming the substitute for his people, Christ Jesus took their legal responsibility. We have a legal responsibility according to the law. If we sin, we must die. And Christ died for us. What is there left to pay? Nothing. 
in becoming the substitute for his people, Christ Jesus took their legal responsibility. In the wonderful words of Scripture, quote, when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Unquote. So what is it to be under the law? Be condemned. Because the law has been violated by each and every one of us. The law had one function, and that was to instruct man on what, as to what sin is and cause him to seek redemption. And that redemption God himself provided in his Son. Okay? It's because of the law we know we're sinners. If we are not aware that we're sinners, why would we seek redemption? The purpose of the law is to condemn. It can only condemn. No one can obey the law perfectly. Only Jesus did. And that's how God bought us back redeemed us. He sent for His Son in the fullness of time, made of a woman just like you and me, made under the law just like you and me, yet He never sinned, not even in one count. That's what made Him the perfect sacrifice. The spotless Lamb. And it's upon His head that we cast all of our sins. And they died with Him. Yet He rose again for our justification. Okay? He was made of a woman just like you and me, tempted in every way as, like a, as we are, yet without sin. He was made under the same law that we are made under. He wrote the law. And he obeyed it to the letter. Why? To redeem us that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Unquote. We're not just the creation of God anymore. We are his sons and daughters, thanks to Jesus and him alone. Continuing now, he said, The Lord God has promised to be a father to true believers, that they shall be his sons and daughters. This is the greatest honor possible. What rank ingratitude that anyone should slander such a gift and spurn Christ Jesus and eternal life in favor of the apostate Roman Catholic Church. What is Richard Bennett saying? That to seek peace and unity and an ecumenical reunion with the Roman Catholic Church, once we have tasted the redemption of Christ in Him alone, and to go back to a system of works to earn our salvation is the most rank expression of ingratitude for Christ that one can imagine. Okay? That is how you slander Christ and what He did for us. To turn away from Him and to seek salvation through a system of works, sacraments, and to not worship the, the all-holy God, but a sinful, wicked man, yea, the Antichrist of Scripture. The most rank expression of ingratitude and slander of our Redeemer is to return 
to the Roman Pharaoh. To return to Roman Catholicism. To embrace it in any degree. That is the rankest ingratitude, the rankest slander of Christ one can commit. Think about it. What rank ingratitude that anyone should slander such a gift and spurn Christ Jesus and eternal life in favor of the apostate Roman Catholic Church. The synagogue of Satan. Hence the Lord promised, quote, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. How can you come to Christ and then voluntarily, with or without your knowledge, become a subject of the quote-unquote Holy Roman Pontiff. They are mutually exclusive. The Scripture plainly tells us we cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve Christ with your mouth and Antichrist with everything else. Because you will love the one and despise the other. Now, the only thing to be decided is which one do you love and which one do you despise? Richard Bennett indicates, and the Scripture indicates, that if you put yourself under the papacy's authority in this ecumenical reunion, especially at the time of the 500th year celebration of the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, you have despised Christ. And you have loved Antichrist. He said, hence the Lord promised, quote, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. What is it to come to Christ? Certainly it cannot be to come to Antichrist. We have got a decision to make. All of us. There are two spirits warring for our souls. Christ the righteous and Antichrist the Roman. Who will you serve? Richard continues, he says, Those who come at the call of God are given to Christ because it is through His blood alone that they can be saved. The Lord God by His Spirit convinces of sin and of righteousness and of judgment those who acknowledge their iniquity and their need for salvation. Is the Lord calling you? Only in the Lord Jesus Christ is found freedom and eternal life. What is found in the Roman Catholic Church? Servitude. Slavery. Works. That can never save and what will be the, the result? Eternal death. By His grace, believe on Him and Him alone. That's Jesus, not the Pope. Believe on Him and Him alone. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Okay? Grace is not of ourselves. We cannot earn it. It's a gift. And if it's not a gift, it's not grace. It's works. For by grace 
Are you saved through faith? And where do we get that faith? That too is a gift. Just as is the Bible a gift. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You believe the Word of God? Then you have faith granted to you. And by that faith in Christ and His shed blood, His atonement, God's grace is imputed to you. The gift. It's not of yourselves. You can't conjure it up. You can't say so many Hail Marys. You can't confess your sins to a priest. You can't get married. You can't have extreme unction. You can't have holy orders. You can't have all or any of the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church and then expect God's imputation of grace. Because you make God a debtor. And no man makes God a debtor. No man could face God and say, you owe me. I did this and this and this and this and this. You owe me. No one can make God a debtor. You are saved by the gift of grace through the gift of faith. And it's not yours to give. It's only His to give. It's not yours to earn because you can't earn it. And you can't make God a debtor. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Unquote. So when you're face to face with Christ, you will have nothing to boast about. Nothing. Just accept your gift with humility. You don't deserve it. None of us do. That's the end of Mark. Of I've done it all throughout this. Martin Luther. Richard Bennett. That's the end of the newsletter entitled Roman Catholic Endeavors to Overturn the Reformation. I highly recommend my listeners to Richard Bennett's website, BereanBeacon.org. Avail yourselves of everything on his website and pray for him. A great saint. We'll dearly miss him when the Lord takes him. Now, the last Richard Bennett newsletter that I'd like to read before we get on to other things. This is entitled, Five Biblical Principles of Reformation. These are the... Well, these things are not debatable. These five basic tenets of the Protestant Reformation, they're scriptural, that's why they're not debatable. They come straight from the Word of Almighty God. They are cast in stone. And you can argue till the cows come home, but you'll never overthrow these five basic principles of Protestantism. These five basic principles of Protestantism is what Rome must destroy before ever the Protestant reformer will be the Protestant Reformation will be over. As long as these five tenets of the Protestant Reformation exist, just as the Bible exists, Rome will never overthrow the Protestant Reformation. And now it's time for us to embrace these five basic tenets of the Roman of of the uh, Protestant Reformation. They're called the five solas. Five Biblical Principles of Reformation. This newsletter was dated October 17, 2015. <clears throat> but they're timeless. 
Richard Bennett writes, all true revival in both Old and New Testament times has been a return to the absolute authority of God's written word. Okay? We want to talk about absolute authority? There is but one in the whole universe. That's God's written word. That is the absolute authority in this universe that God created. The absolute authority of God's written word was normative for the Old Testament saints. Likewise, the absolute authority for Jesus Christ and for the apostles was God's written word and that alone. It is of utmost importance to understand that because of mankind's utterly lost condition, Richard Bennett believes what the Bible teaches, the, 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 the total depravity of man. Okay? It's not taught in the churches today. It's not taught in the press. It's not taught in the schools. It's not taught anywhere but in the Bible. You're not okay. I'm not okay. We are all lost and undone. And until we are redeemed by God, we will suffer a Christless eternity. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeketh after God. None. No pope, no priest, no pastor, no priester, no one seeks after God. It's God who seeks man who leaves the ninety and nine and seeks after the one that was lost. We are all totally depraved. That depravity began in the Garden of Eden. It continues to today. And it's God and God alone who can wash us of that depravity. And we cannot wash it away ourselves. It is of the utmost importance to understand that because of man's utterly lost condition, God has deemed it fit to make himself his will and purpose known only through his written word. While God can be known through general revelation, which is revealed in creation, his nature, his character, and his sovereign purpose in salvation and sanctification are known only through his written word. Okay? No direct revelation. The Holy Spirit told me this or that. No, no, no. It's the written word of God. And if the Holy Spirit tells you anything directly, it will not contradict anything that's in the written Word of God. No holy apparition is going to tell you anything contrary to the written Word of God. No spirit called holy or otherwise is going to tell you anything but what is written in the holy written Word of God. No dream that you may dream is from God if it contradicts what is written in the written Word of God. There are many, many spirits, many, many dreamers, many, many of those who say they've heard from God and from the Holy Spirit that believe contrary to the written Word of God. There is only one thing you can trust implicitly, the infallible written Word of God. And that is the King James Bible. We'll be back right after this.
Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host cause and anywhere else the spirit may lead you do all to the glory of our god and creator for his holy nation the only kingdom that will last forever thank you for listening since the beginning of time kings have sought it nations have fought for it it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, and I encourage you to do so, please support First Amendment Radio, who sponsors the program. For my part, all I ask for my listeners is prayer. Lots of prayer. The prayers of a righteous man availeth much. I need much prayer. We're talking about the five basic biblical principles of the Protestant Reformation. This is Richard Bennett's newsletter entitled The Five Biblical Principles of Reformation. We'll just call it the five basic principles of biblical Christianity the apostolic Christianity, the true Christianity. There are many counterfeits in the world, and only one can call itself true. This is the true Christianity, biblical Christianity. And of those five biblical principles, we're talking specifically now about the first one, sola scriptura, the scriptures alone, the written word of God alone. That's our final authority. That's God speaking to man. And its best translation for English-speaking people is the authorized King James Version of the Bible. The only Bible that can interpret itself. It's a word-for-word -word translation of the original manuscripts of the majority text, the Textus Receptus. It's reliable and trustworthy. And the proof is in the pudding. 
More souls have been saved by God's grace through the faith that is given to man through the authorized King James Version of the Bible than any of the other Bibles. It has produced a heaven full of saints. And it will continue to do so until that word arrives in person. And we look forward to that day. Now under the subtitle, God's written word is final. Under, We're still talking about sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. Richard Bennett writes, The absolute authority for mankind is not to be placed in any subjective interpretation of what God himself has purportedly said. What has Richard Bennett just told you? Most of the counterfeit Bibles now in circulation, that is the lion's share of the Bibles that are now carried by quote-unquote Christians, rely on what is called dynamic equivalence instead of word-for-word -word translation. A word-for-word -word translation takes the original language and, trans and translates it into another language word-for-word. Okay? Somebody's going to quote you. The best way to quote you is word for word. So that the meaning's not lost. All right. A dynamic equivalency translation is when one reads the original language, interprets what God meant to say, and then translates what the translator thinks God meant to say. There's one problem with that. It's the same problem we experience when we begin to tell a lie. The problem with telling a lie, and we've all experienced this, haven't we? Haven't we? Yes, we have. We've all lied. <clears throat> the problem with telling a lie is you have to tell the lie the same way twice, three times, an infinite number of times. Otherwise, the lie is discovered. You have to remember what, how exactly you lied. <laughs> Whereas the truth just comes naturally. If you tell a lie, you have to remember how you told it and tell it the same way every time. Now, our fallible minds eventually forget Let's see, what did I say? What, what, what story did I use last time? And all of a sudden, the cat's out of the bag. You're discovered as being a liar. That's what happens when you read a Bible that uses dynamic equivalence because the truth is not told the same way every time. So much so that those Bibles can't even interpret themselves. That's why so many people are ignorant who read those Bibles. And that's why so many people have learned to doubt the authenticity of that which they call the Word of God. Because it doesn't connect. Only the authorized King James Bible, a word-for-word -word translation, can interpret itself. And generates its own trust. When someone tells the truth, one doesn't have to lie. And the truth just flows from his mouth the same way every time. There's no attempt to conceal. There's no attempt to couch. There's no need to remember the lie because the truth just flows. The authorized King James Version of the Bible just flows. None of the others do. Key to knowing that you have the correct, authentic Word of God is a Bible that can interpret itself and thereby eliminate the need for you to seek the help of a man to understand it. Simply by comparing Scripture with Scripture. One comes to the truth. One 
witnesses for himself the consistency of the Bible. And through that consistency, that repetition in different places in the Bible, possibly using different words, but the same meaning, one can make connection from this part of the Bible to this part of the Bible to that part of the Bible. And you find out that God never contradicts himself. It may say things, the same thing in different mean, different, different words, but the meaning is the same. And so it interprets itself. Not so with the other Bibles. He said the absolute authority for mankind is not to be placed in any subjective interpretation of what God himself has purportedly said. Rather, such an appeal to and answer purportedly from God himself as the absolute authority is an attempt, whether through ignorance or through sub, uh, presumption, to break the finality of God's written word. So what has been the purpose of all of these dynamic equivalency Bibles to break the finality, the authority of God's written word. And where do we get all of these counterfeit Bibles? You'll find they are from the Roman Catholic Church, from the Jesuit order. They're called Jesuit Bibles now by those of us who've done this research. The Jesuits, the Roman Catholic Church, must destroy the finality, the authority of God's written word to get God's people to believe another gospel and seek another means of salvation beside the one that God himself provided. And so the world is flooded with counterfeit Bibles that cannot interpret themselves, so you must seek the advice and, and, and teaching from a man, usually one who calls himself a priest, who says he's the only one that can understand the Scripture, or his church is the only church that can understand the Scripture and teach it to you. They are the only ones granted by God to teach because they're the only ones that can understand. And you can't read it for yourself and get any understanding because... <laughs> it's not meant to teach. There's, these new Bibles are not meant to teach you. So you have to rely on the priest. You have to rely on the Roman Catholic Church. Otherwise, you're left with a contradicting Bible. See what they've done? He said the Bible is full of statements upholding the signal fact that his written word is the final law for mankind. The Bible is chock full of statements upholding the signal fact that his written word, the Bible, is the final law for mankind. The final law. But what does the Roman Catholic Church have? Roman Catholic canon law, which has replaced the final law for mankind in the written word of God. Richard says it is, an, it is evidenced by hundreds of references in the Old Testament, as for example, Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20, quote, to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word, the law and the testimony, it is because there is no light in them, unquote. All right? So if you're in discussion, and the person to whom you are speaking is not speaking according to the law and the testimony, that is the Bible, the law and the testimony, the light of truth is not in him. You can walk away from him. Now, who is it that teaches not according to the word of God, the law and the testimony? The Bible. The papacy in the Roman Catholic Church. 
there's no light in them. Likewise, in the New Testament, it's written, it is the written Word of God and it alone to which the Lord Jesus Christ and His apostles refer as final authority. In the Testament, that is, or rather, no, rather, in the temptation, excuse me, in the temptation, we're talking about Christ's 40 days of temptation, in the temptation, Jesus three times repelled Satan, saying, quote, it is written, unquote. As for example, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, quote, he said, but he answered and said, quote, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, unquote. So what was Jesus' final authority? His own written word. And when Jesus refuted the errors of the Sadducees, the Lord said, quote, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God, unquote. The Lord's total acceptance of the authority of the Old Testament is seen in His words in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, quote, Think not that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. That's the law and the testimony, right? The Bible. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no ways pass, no wise pass from the law, that's the law and the testimony, till all be fulfilled, unquote. So what was the final authority for Christ? His own written word. Now shall we have another authority than his? Shall we allow the Pope to give us final authority? Does the Roman Catholic Church possess the same final authority that Christ had? No. It has its own authority. And she boasts of her own authority even the de to the degree that she may dispense with the word that is the law and the testimony entirely. And she has. That's Roman Catholic canon law, that one of the powers of the Pope is to dispense or to do away with the Bible entirely. And that is what they have done. But Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So no matter the claim of the Roman Catholic Church, no matter the claim of the power of the popes, they have none. None. He said on the night before he was crucified, Jesus prayed to his Father with the clearest words, quote, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Unquote. The Bible stands on its own authority. It is the only authority, and it can't stand on anything else, right? It's the only authority. God is the only authority in the universe. And we to pay no heed to other authorities. Now, where does that put us in this world? We are for Christ and His Word, and we're opposed to everything else. That's an unhappy position to be in, except for those who understand what the stakes are. This whole world is governed by the man of sin. All civil law is written to conform us all to Roman Catholic canon law, and not to the sole sovereign authority of Almighty God, the written word. The whole world has been deceived. Shall we remain in this deception? Richard continues. He says, Christ Jesus also said that Scripture could not be broken. The Bible testifies of its own essential truth. Quote, The sum of thy word is truth. 
if you add it all up, the total, that is the sum of thy word, is true. In other words, it's all true. There's no error in it. Because if there's error in any of the elements of the addition, then the sum will be wrong. Isn't that correct? So if the sum, that is the total of God's word is truth, then every element comprising that total must also be true. Right? If you're going to add up a bunch of figures and come to the correct summation, the correct sum, the correct total, then every element in that equation must also be true. Isn't that correct? It is correct. So can we find fault with King James Bible? If we do, then the sum of thy word is not true. But how many out there pretend to find fault with the King James Bible? Multitudes. Somebody asked me one time, Tom, how do you know you got the right Bible? They're all different. How do you know you got the right one? That's easy. That's the easiest one to answer. And I always congratulate people for asking the $64,000 question. I just love to answer this one. How do you know you have the right Bible? It's the one everybody criticizes. It's the one the world rejects. yet it is the one that has saved the most souls. That's the correct Bible. And if someone were to ask me, well, which one is that? <laughs> Hands down. The authorized King James Bible. There's a whole world of scholarship out there that is dead set to destroy the King James Bible. And it's been going on for centuries to the point now where some tell me that if they go to a Bible bookstore and they want an authorized King James Version, it has to be special ordered because they don't carry it. <laughs> they seek another truth, one where the elements do not add up. And there is a world full of Bibles that do just that. If they speak not according to to this word, the law of the prophets, there's no light in them. Thou art God, and thy words be truth. That's what the Bible says of itself. The written word of God is the word of truth. That's what the Bible says of itself. God says of his written word, quote, these words are faithful and true, unquote. The written word of God is infallible and inerrant in all areas, earthly as well as spiritual. You want to know about the natural world? You want to be able to refute the scientists? Read the Bible. Read the words of the one who created this entire universe. He knows. He's the ultimate authority. He created it. Surely he knows what he created and how it functions. He knows as much about the physical earth as he does the spiritual realm. He created all of it. The ultimate authority in natural and spiritual things, that's everything is the authorized King James Version of the Bible. And to deny the inherent truth and in the in inerrancy of the Bible is to call God a liar. And that's what the world does. All together in unison, they call God a liar. Now let me give you just one example. <laughs> the one we're faced with every day. A term that has become cliché, global warming, climate change, they're all the same thing. We are to believe that the God who created this heaven and earth and everything that's in it 
and then turned around and told man to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth, somehow miscalculated and didn't provide an earth that was able to sustain a world full of people. First they call God a fool, and then they call him a liar. There's just not enough energy. There's just not enough water. There's just not enough food. There's just not enough natural resources. There's just not enough, quote-unquote, fossil fuel to sustain a world full of people. God is a fool, God is a liar, and we have to depend upon Pope Francis to bail us out of this mess. And what's his solution? Same solution has been for all the popes throughout history. Till. You all familiar with the Georgia Guidestones? Who do you think created that abomination? Oh, I'm sorry, I think I've offended many of my own listeners who think that's a good policy. Reduce the Earth's population down to 500 million people. Then we'll live on an Earth that's capable of sustaining that amount of people. And therefore we support mercy killing and that sort of thing. Euthanasia? Where's God in all this? Nowhere. Only the man of sin. That's where the source of all the lies come from. If you get an opportunity to listen to Pope Francis or any of his papal stooges talk about global warming or sustainability or climate change, you can see for yourself with your own eyes. You won't need me to testify to you who authored these lies and called God a fool and a liar. Antichrist. I'll see you tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.